the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Be still and know that I am God. Take a moment this day and be still long enough to take in the year that has happened. Take in this last Sunday of the church year, Christ the King Sunday. Take in this truth. Christ is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And Christ sees something beautiful in you. There's a lot more to the story. We heard from Colossians a lot more about what happened on the cross, a lot more about what the story means for us. But when I read this story, I think of those truths. Christ is beautiful, and that he sees something beautiful in us. This is the final page of the story. The last Sunday of the church year, it's Christ the King Sunday. I'm sure you got all your Christ the King cards sent out. You picked out your Christ the King outfit, or at least one person did, are newly baptized or soon to be baptized. Uh, we've got all our Christ the King presents wrapped. You know, this Sunday really doesn't get the kind of attention that we give Christmas or Easter. But maybe it begs the question, do we give Christmas and Easter the stillness that it needs to take it in? To fully realize what it is that we proclaim in those days. And so we have this moment. Before we start a new year, before we tear into our Thanksgiving plans, we have this moment to be still. To know that God is God. To breathe in that beautiful image. To see the beauty of God's love. Hold it deep. And to trust it. As I read this story, this gospel. And the gospels in the last few weeks, uh, which haven't been easy weeks, they've spoken to me, not necessarily always as the priest that has to uh, preach to the congregation, but as the person trying to figure it out the person in need of good news, of grace, of something to hold on to. And Jesus never fails. And as I read today's gospel, and I think back on the stories that have transpired over the year, those healing stories of, of Jesus uh, providing grace uh, to those that desperately need it, touch to those isolated from other human beings, Communion with those that have been exiled from the church. Healing and forgiveness to those that feel unworthy. Wholeness to those with a gaping, missing part of their person. As I read today's story, all of those come into form in a giant mosaic shaped by this story that sums it all up. Our beautiful Christ who sees something beautiful in us. <coughs> I was in Costa Rica about a decade ago on a mission trip, uh, and we were building a house, and somebody uh, was telling a story as we uh, heard, and, uh, uh, and, and, and people talked about all of the incredible uh, uh, woods that they have there in Costa Rica, and a lot of them have been, um, a lot of the uh, uh, hardwoods have been uh, overforested, uh, or deforested, and um, they talked about this woodworker, the simple woodworker who had a very tough life, uh, who had a lot of troubles, uh, and he would make crosses, and that was his ministry and his profession. And so we went and we saw him, um, uh, and this was the cross that he made, and all of his crosses were like this. He didn't have any crosses that weren't, uh, and it's a little hard to see because it's a little bit abstract, uh, but you see there's only one of the, the arms of the cross uh, and you see his arm, and you see his head tilted. Uh, he said, this is how I know the cross is about me. He said, it's not just a cross hanging thousands of years ago. It is Jesus' head turned towards me. And the full life I've lived, the brokenness I've experienced, the things I've done wrong. Uh, but this story from Luke of Jesus on the cross, looking over to somebody totally broken, and saying, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's me know that in all of my addiction and all of the other things uh, that I've done wrong, all the people in, uh, in my life that, uh, that I have pushed away or hurt, that Jesus' 
love on the cross was for me. And so I make these crosses just like this because I want people to know the cross is their story. That's the story we have today. It's a beautiful story. Uh, and as I read back over the gospel and I thought about all the stories that seemed so perfectly into it, it seemed like a fitting way to end the year. And I invite you to picture that moment, that moment with three crosses, with Jesus there on the cross. And I invite you to put all of the stories, and not just the stories from the gospel, but all of the heartbreaking and joyous and full moments of the last year into that mosaic, into that beautiful uh, a stained glass window or mosaic, mosaic piece of art, uh, and see how they all bind so perfectly together. So the image we have today, Jesus nailed to a cross, moments from death, being mocked, ridiculed, feeling as alone as we could possibly feel. Alone from God, Father, why have you forsaken me? Alone from humanity, alone from those that followed him and cheerleaded for him and thought he was the greatest thing to ever happen to their lives, who somehow mysteriously disappeared when the going got tough whose fear superseded their loyalty. The folks who at least gave him attention, who were berating him, who were torturing him, who were challenging him. How alone he must have felt, close to death, alone, and his two actions. The two things that he did in that moment are so gospel and so beautiful. Father, please forgive them. Father, please forgive them. Those that will sit in the pews 2,000 years later wondering whether they're worthy, wondering whether God knows their sins and can see past them. The two on my left and right, the people that are hiding uh, and ashamed of their fear, the people that are doing this to me and don't quite understand why. Forgive them. And to the broken man who realizes he's getting what he deserves, at least in terms of the legal system. Today you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful, beautiful image. This moment filled with all of those love-drenched stories. They're all pages of the very same love story. God, it's beautiful love, see something lovable in us. Our king is not about self or might, but is about emptying God's self for all of us. Poured out. And as I stand and just let the beauty wash over me, heal me, hold me, I see between all of those stories that fill the window two bookends. I see that moment that in some way we'll recreate in a few minutes. That moment when Jesus takes on all of humanity, that who has no sin, takes on all of the horrible things we do to one another, all of the things that bring us shame, all of those uh, moments of unworthiness, all of those sins that are floating in the River Jordan, he takes them all on and he submerges himself under those waters as all of our brokenness wash around him and as he comes out of the water and the light shines down and the voice of God uh, as he's dripping with all of humanity representing for all of us the person behind all of the brokenness, who comes through all of the brokenness, and God says, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. That book and up to that moment where this man whose life has taken several wrong turns, and we don't know many of the details of him, but he realizes he's not on the cross by accident. He got what he deserved, he got caught. And as he says, remember me, Jesus says to him, with the same love that came down from, from heaven as he came out of the river Jordan, the same love says to him, you will be with me in paradise. And another book here. This one's helpful as we struggle uh, with the things that we don't understand, the things that we wish God would just remove from us. See, the way it all ended after that baptism, when he was sent out into the wilderness and tempted with all of those ifs. If you're the son of God, save yourself. If you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, uh, fall down from this temple and let the angels of God catch you. All of those ifs. 
met with the ifs in this part of the story at the other end. If you are the Messiah, if you are the king, save yourself. Come down from that cross. And while you're at it, can you save us too? And Jesus does the harder thing, the more painful thing. And he stays on the cross. And he pours himself out about as brave as anything a human can do, as anything a God can do, to sit in the pain and the hurt and the brokenness and be there. Sometimes it's easier to change the course than it is to sit and be present in the bottom of our human condition. Those ifs. The last couple of weeks, people have come to me with two primary questions. Why do these things happen? Why doesn't God keep this from happening? Why does God let this happen to me? I think that image and those ifs that we see up there answer that question. That God loves us enough to be there. God, we wish God would just get off the cross and take us with him, but God loves us more than that. God loves us boldly enough to not get off that cross. And the second, what happens next? After this doesn't end the way we want it to, what happens next? And that solace. Can you imagine what that moment would have felt like for that broken soul in the last moments of his life to have God incarnate say to him, be with me in paradise. I don't know what heaven looks like. But I'm sure it feels like the way that that moment coursed through this man as all of a sudden, all of the difficulty and turmoil of his life, all of his brokenness, all of his mistakes washed away. And he knew that he was loved. He knew that he was beautiful. Or at very least, God saw something beautiful in him. <coughs> And I imagine that that feeling was a taste, a taste of what heaven would be like. So this is not Easter. It's not Christmas. It doesn't have all the fanfare. But maybe that's a good thing. Because maybe it gives us enough time to stop, to be still, to know that God is God. Hold that image, that beautiful mosaic, to trust it, to seal it in our hearts. God is beautiful. Christ is beautiful. And Christ sees beauty in you. Amen.